Hey, everybody, if you've ever had an idea for a show but haven't figured out how to get it to paper, tune into the webinar this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, How to Write a Script in 30 Days Guaranteed. Check out all the information at theproducersperspective.com. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Ken Davenport. I'm very excited to have with my guest today, the artistic director of the Atlantic Theater Company, Mr. Neil Pepe. Welcome, Neil. Hi, Ken. Thanks for being here. So Neil has been the artistic director of the Atlantic since 1992. Correct. Which you must have been like three years old. Out of the womb, he becomes the artistic director. Of the yeah, I was, I was young. I was 29. Yeah, I was young. I was a young man, yeah. Well, under his reign, the Atlantic has helped give birth to incredible plays and musicals like Spring Awakening. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, Beauty Queen of Lenon and many other Martin McDonough plays, Mammoth plays. Most recently, The Band's Visit, which Little Birdie tells me may be rumored to be coming to the Great White Way. We're hoping. Neil is also a Broadway director on his own, having helmed shows like Hands on a Hard Body and the infamous production of Speed the Plow with and without Jeremy Piven. <laughs> So, Neil, how did you find your way into a theater? Where did it all start for you? Well, I, I you know, I was, I grew up in an artsy family. I grew up in, in Southern Vermont. My mother was a, a sculptor and my dad was a jazz drummer slash composer teacher. So we were in this kind of artsy community and I, some friends of mine were doing plays when I was little. So I did a little acting here and there while also playing in bands. I went to a progressive school in Southern Vermont called the Putney School, which is kind of well-known. Some great people like Wally Shaw and others went there. They had a great acting program, so I acted there and played music there. Went on to a great school, Kenyon College in Ohio. We're doing apprenticeships all over the place, Williamstown, Actors Theater of Louisville, and then finally ended up in New York in 1985. And when you came to New York in 85, were you like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm all in on the theater. This is what I want to do. I was all in on being an actor and a musician. So I was playing in bands, I was playing guitar and singing in bands, and I was acting as much as I possibly could, and studying and parking cars to make a living. And while I was parking cars, I met uh, Clark Gregg, who was working with the newly formed Atlantic Theater Company. They had all, all studied with Mamet and David Mamet and H. Macy at NYU. And so I, I decided I would help out with them. That was my first encounter with them. And why did you lean towards directing? What about directing said to you, oh, this is my place in the theater? That was a transition that came later. I mean, ironically, for my senior thesis in college, I directed my this wonderful professor I had, Thomas Turgeon, at Kenyon, said, hey, why don't you direct? So I, he suggested I direct Craft's Last Tape, the Beckett play. And so I did, and it went very well. But at that time, I only wanted to act, and for about... 12 or 15 years, I did just act, but I had always had an interest in, I loved, I loved writers. I loved um, working with writers and I always seemed to have ideas about how I thought stories should be told. So as I got more involved with the Atlantic and saw opportunities and people gave me opportunities to direct, then I, um, I thought I would direct more. And it also, once I became artistic director, it was sort of more practical for me to direct than act. Hmm. So here's one of my James Lipton questions. I want you to imagine you're on a bar stool in like, I don't know, some pick town in Nebraska. Now all the people from Nebraska, the listener, are going to get mad at me for calling <laughs> we you. We love town. Nebraska. Yeah, we love Nebraska. <laughs> uh, so I want you to imagine you're on this bar stool there and you're sitting there and someone says, hey, what do you do that has never seen a play before? How would you describe what a director does to someone who doesn't know the theater? I bring stories to life and put them up in front of people. And um, I guess I'm, I'm in the business of finding great stories that speak to the times in which we live and hiring amazing actors and writers while well, finding the great stories from the writers and hiring amazing actors and designers to bring them to life in front of people. And hopefully by doing that, when, when people come to see those shows, they will not only be entertained, but they'll look at life in a slightly different way. Sometimes it'll it'll perhaps open up something, a truth that they didn't know about or allow them to reflect on something they hadn't reflected on or maybe change their outlook on something. But at the very least, it will show ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances and people trying to be heroic. And there's something about 
telling stories in that way that I think helps us all not only live life, but perhaps live life more meaningfully and more valuably and have more enjoyment living life. Now, what does an artistic director do? Same gig? An artistic director runs the organization. So an artistic director is responsible for choosing all the plays that an organization does. And I think he's responsible responsible for artistically guiding those plays, you know, not only from the choice of the play, but helping the writers realize what, what they what they want to realize. Making sure the, the plays are sort of artistically put together in a way that uh, serves the play. And uh, finding a kind of season of plays that complement each other and you know, have, have different things going on. I mean, I'll tend to look at seasons and go, okay, we've got this particular kind of musical here and maybe this two person show here and emerging writer that's exciting here and, and maybe writing for overseas or, or, so you want to sort of get a, a varied group of stories, but frankly, I, I look at it in a very dumb way. If I can turn to my friends and say, yeah, I think this is a great season of plays. You may want to pay, you know, anywhere from 45 to $75 a ticket for, I should be able to say that to my friends. And if I can't say that to my friends, I need to think again. How far in advance do you choose your seasons? I think this is something... Not far enough. Not far enough. I mean, I, I, I've i gotten much better at it. I used to wait way too long. But I think we tend to try to have our seasons finalized by the March prior to the next season. Our seasons go September to June. So we try to announce our seasons by March or April. There are times where I'll hold a slot open, because as you probably know better than most, that there are times when projects come along that you need to move on right away. And because so many people announce their seasons so early, you want to have the flexibility to possibly, if somebody comes to you and says, I've got this show, everybody's available now, we want to move on it now, do you have a slot? you want some flexibility to be able to offer something up. So in many, in historically, many times that's worked very well. I mean, ironically, one of the most successful seasons we ever had, the Lieutenant of Inishmore, we decided on in June 15th, prior to the September and Spring Awakening, the same season, we didn't decide until the end of July. So the, both of those choices were very late for all the reasons that one would think. They weren't sort of, you know, the things didn't get together until that time. So I had the ability to do that. It's harder and harder, as you know, to plan that late because you have to fundraise and you have to get everything together. So I try to try to do it as early as possible now, but um, but still sometimes I'll make late choices. So you've been sitting behind the artistic director desk for a few years now. Yeah. What has changed since when you were, when you first started? What's the biggest change you've seen as an AD? Well, the good news is I think there's more theater going on in New York City than in any time I've been here. I feel like when I got out of school in 85, there was a decent amount happening, but I feel like the amount of off-off Broadway that's happening, the amount of like fringe theater, theater festivals, opportunities for young people to go into a venue and get it reviewed by a fairly major publication is higher. So it means the competition is is tougher, I think, than it used to be. What else has changed? I think obviously it's become more expensive. Real estate has become a lot more expensive. So our ability to survive and actually, you know, occupancy charges, things like that, just to have a theater and pay the rent, or if you can, you know, manage to buy a theater just to afford all of that, that's changed. And then finally, I think it's been interesting, and maybe maybe you find this too as a, as a Broadway producer. I think it's partially due for the, the, the music industry going through such a transitional time. It feels like there's a flood of stuff happening on Broadway. There's all these people, like, you know, great rock and roll composers, all these people who now want to be on Broadway. Probably, one, it's an exciting place to be, and there's a lot of creative things happening on Broadway. But two, since nobody's making any money selling records anymore, it feels like if you got something happening on Broadway... You can really, you know, it can be great and make you can make a lot of money and have a lot of creative success. So that's become a little, I think that's become more intense than it was. But that being said, I, f I find it a very exciting time for writing. I think there's a lot of great, great playwrights out there. And I think there's also 
there was a point in the last downturn of the economy where everybody was wondering, oh, you know, the theater is the first thing to go. You know, nobody can afford it. It's only for the, the elite. I think the opposite happened. Everybody came to the theater. We survived it. Not only did we survive it, it felt like people craved live entertainment. So it's been heartening for me to still feel, even though I've had moments for myself of going, wow, how is it that I spent all this time in this, in off-Broadway theater? You, you don't make that much money and, you know, all, but it's heartening to know that people come back because there's a real value in great plays and edgy uh, writers that are taking risks. And I think off-Broadway is where we can do that. So it's been exciting to me that theater is alive and well, you know, and I, I didn't necessarily expect that. I find it easier to raise money now than you did at the beginning or the same or worse? It's, well, it's certainly when you have a proven track record, when you've been in the game for a while and people start to know your work and like your work or at least trust. I mean, look, we're not always going to produce plays that everybody likes and nor are we going to, you know, produce. We're not about sort of producing hits. We're about investing in artists and process and all that stuff. But once you have a track record, it's always easier to raise money. And there's certain amazing foundations who start to believe in you and back you year to year, whether it's through general op or project specific things. And then, of course, I think this is something else that's changed. And, and you know about this as well as anybody is the relationship between commercial and not for profit theater. That's become a more productive relationship, I think, because on the one hand, in order for off-Broadway theaters to do larger scale projects, especially musicals, it's become harder and harder because there's not, there's no longer federal and state funding, there's barely any federal and state funding, nor is there major foundational support for large projects. So that meant that commercial producers and not-for-profit theaters had to come together to help each other. And I think that's been the nice, the, you know, the upside of enhancement deals is, you know, a, a sort of mutual assistance in in us being able to develop projects and then hopefully to the benefit if if a, if a commercial producer likes what they what what's happened they can help that show have a longer life and 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 hopefully a long and, and fruitful and economically viable commercial life how have the best of those relationships worked for you? How do you deal with a produced guy? I come to you and I say, I have a script, which I do by the way, right. talked about it after. Right. But I come to you and I say <clears throat> I, I've got this script. How is that navigation of, well, is it, because it's in your theater, right? Yeah, I mean, so, I, it's, it is a, it's a really important question. And actually, it was a very controversial question, I think, when this first started happening, sort of more in the early 80s-ish, maybe, when or even late 70s, where, you know, we're a 501c3 mission-based theater company. So all of our work is about, you know, serving the mission of our theater. Our, our theater's mission is to produce great plays simply and truthfully utilizing an artistic ensemble, which is, sounds like a very basic mission and it sort of broke down from a lot of philosophies that we embraced over the years. So if a commercial producer comes in and says, I've got this play, first and foremost, I'm going to look at it and say, does this fit into what I understand to be the mission of the Atlantic Theater Company? And if I say yes, then we'll have a meeting and I'll say, look, We'd love to produce this. We'll produce it for you. And obviously, because you are giving us, usually it's a fairly significant amount of money, there's going to be a certain amount of collaboration on it. But essentially, the commercial producer is handing it over to the Atlantic Theater Company to kind of for the nuts and bolts producing of it. And for some of the larger decisions, there'll be collaboration. But I think where it can go awry is two two things. If, if it feels like a vessel... You know, if it feels like commercial producers coming in just to use this sort of organization, say, well, I can use all of that, but I'm really running the show, then it doesn't work. Because then, then, it, then honestly, from a really practical point of view, the decision for the commercial producer is simple. If you want to produce it yourself, produce it yourself. You know, the hard part, obviously, then is, well, that's hard. It's a, it's a Broadway musical. That's going to cost me $13 million. Wouldn't it be better to give... A not-for-profit anywhere from 300 to 800 I don't know, some people are getting a million or more, whatever amount of enhancement money. Yeah, that's fine. But if you're going to do that, understand you're giving it over to an, art, you know, an organization that has a mission. So if you can live with that mission, great. But where it gets into gray areas, I think, when the commercial producer is thinking, I'm giving this money and I'm the lead producer, then I go... Actually, if you want to be the lead producer, just produce it yourself. That's totally cool, but that's what you should do. 
I want to get back to your process of picking a, a season because it sounds like it's a lot about your you go to your friends or the idea that concept of yeah. could you sell it to your friends how how important do you think it is for an artistic director of a mission based theater company to take into the account the interests of the audience do you get feedback from them do you take that into account or do you believe look I am going to choose what I think this audience is good for this audience or do you say yeah tell me what you want to hear and, and we'll and see and we'll we'll deliver that for you to go backwards I've never been a person to go to the audience and say tell me what you want to hear because I sort of equate it with like tell me what to dress tell me how, tell me what I should dress going to your party that will make people like me it doesn't make sense to me I think we're put in the positions we're put in because hopefully we're good at what we do you know, it's a doctor doesn't come to you and say, how do you think I should cure your disease? You know, it doesn't make sense to me. So that being said, the audience is an integral, huge part of what we do. So first and foremost, I feel like my responsibility as an artistic leader is to take that position seriously, be well-educated, be very cognizant of how to do that job well, what, a, what makes, cultivate my sort of thoughts and, and opinions and and taste for what defines a good play and then also identify around me so to sniff out who I think are great writers who I think are great artists and who I think are trusted smart advisors about good work so once I've done that then it's about leading the audience it's about saying hey here's what we want to do here's the kind of work that we're trying to do here's the process by which we're trying to do it and we really want to involve you, but it's not about you saying, oh, we like that or we hated it. It's just about saying, come on, you know, we hope you like the work that we do and you're not going to like all of it. But if you can get on board with the process, you will be a valued part of the community. I think it gets tricky when the cart leads the horse, so to speak. So I really find that the best, the best thing I can do is to continue to seek out world-class artists and writers who I think are doing great work and speaking to the times in which we live and finding pieces or I call it even event-driven theater that, that what's the spark about the, the show? What's the thing about this play? Whether it's, oh my God, it's, it's saying something that's never been said or like Spring Awakening, you're putting together, you know, a Duncan Sheik and Bill T. Jones and Michael Mayer and Stephen Sater and then all these incredible young people. And just that sort of alchemy has the sparks. That people go, oh, I've got to check that out. You know, or who's this Irish author, Martin McDonough, who's, you know, there's cats getting blown up on stage. Well, what the hell's going on there? You know, so there's, there's always something about why we might have to see that. And I, I guess the final thing I'll say is I value the audience so much, especially during previews, because as you know, you know, on Broadway and off Broadway, especially when we're doing new work, we rehearse it and then we get into previews. And usually we have at least three or four weeks of previews. So when we put it up in front of an audience, I listen very carefully and watch what story points the audience gets, what they don't. And that's where I'll very much pay attention and adjust depending on how something's working or not. So in that way, the audience is part of the equation. The audience part of the equation is huge. But I don't think it leads the choice of plays. And I don't think it ever should. You talked a little bit about the directing on Broadway and directing off Broadway. What's, besides the obvious, <clears throat> what's the other major differences? And do you enjoy one or the other? If, if someone said you could only direct in one place for the rest of your life and they both paid the same... Which one would you choose? It's really hard because, look, they're both so exciting in different ways. I mean, Broadway, as you know, I mean, Broadway, it's, it's thrilling. It's an amazing, I mean, it's this, I, 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 I do think it's like the, th the center of the world in terms of theater. And there's something like when you have a show on Broadway and when you feel like what you're putting up there is working and whether it's a comedy and you hear the laughs or you get to a great dramatic moment and you can hear a pin drop in a thousand seat house. It's thrilling. And those beautiful theaters on Broadway. So there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And so I, I loved that. And I, of course, I feel lucky to have directed three shows on Broadway. And I knock wood, I'll get to direct ten more. We'll see, you know, if I'm lucky. 
So that's amazing. And as you also know, the tough part is there's a huge amount of financial pressure on Broadway. And there's a huge amount of pressure about how do you sell tickets and what equation do you need stars? There's a lot of quote unquote commercial pressures. And the thrilling thing about off Broadway is it's very much about process. So you'll have less discussions about wait, you know, the poster isn't sexy enough or this isn't commercial enough or that person is not a big enough star to sell tickets. It's so much about just the work and the process of making the play and the story the best it can be. So for the development of new work and for the the sort of arena to take risks and to allow young people and allow writers who are pushing the envelope to really blossom... It's it's an amazing environment off Broadway to do that. It's much harder to do that on Broadway just because it's a much, it's a big audience. I, I always yeah, I always equate a little bit with the music industry. It's like having a great music club as opposed to playing a stadium. You know what I mean? And sometimes you see the, the amazing improvisation or these smaller things happen in a club, and then you see other extraordinary larger event things happen on Broadway. So they're, they're, they're slightly different animals. Both are exciting. I hope I never have to make the, that choice that you just said. I've spent most of my life off Broadway. I'm proud of it. I love it. I find the, the people that populate this community are in New York, off Broadway, are extraordinary. And I'm constantly inspired by the people I work with. Let's talk a little bit about that process. So you sign on to direct a brand new play. Yeah. You have the script in front of you. What, what's the first thing you do before, to, before you attack directing a new play? It's really story, story, story. So what I mean by that is it's, you know, so much of the philosophy that we come from is about fulfilling the playwright's intentions. So it's reading the script over and over and, and analyzing the script and really trying to understand how it works. What's the best way to, what is this story? How do we tell it in the most effective, essential exciting way possible and how do we serve it and how do I bring that play into rehearsal and help help the actors get underneath it and and then fly currently I'm, I have the great honor of working on a, a brand new world premiere of David, uh, David Mamet's newest play The Penitent and Mamet's somebody who I've he was my mentor from very early on and gave me you know the reason I was able to direct on Broadway was because of David Mamet and so it's it's extraordinary when you have a writer of Mammoth's caliber. It's getting underneath it, honoring the language and the story, and then, again, making sure that you're paying attention to all the story corners and filling them and making sure that physically you, you know, bring the right blocking to it, design the right set to help it all, all take place. And then, you know, beyond that, pay attention. Listen to the actors, know when to get out of the way, listen to the playwright, and take all that information and translate it into making the best show possible. So it's a really exciting process. Every time I think I've got it nailed, I realize, oh, I don't really know anything and I should just sit back and listen. And that's helpful. You know what I mean? Because every show is different. And the more extraordinary actors you work with, sometimes you sit back and go, oh, just let them do it. Stop getting in their way. And then other times you realize, oh, no, 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 actually, that's a trick they're doing. They might have a couple of tricks. And if I can find, if I can get them out of that, they might not be able to hide behind that trick. And then all of a sudden it becomes a more vulnerable, truthful performance or more active. So the older I get, the more experience I get, I just try to keep my eye on, you know, simplicity and truth and really trying to help as opposed to hinder. Speaking of actors, what do you look for when during an audition process? Are you a person that can recognize pretty quickly whether someone has what it takes? I think I can. I mean, I, I know what I respond to. I mean, actors who have a good sense of themselves and can bring the truth of themselves to the character. I mean, you, you recognize that right away. You know, if you feel like somebody is, quote unquote, acting, you know, that's you don't. It's that it's that thing. You you really want to be surprised by the truth of what you're seeing, and and that's always, of, of course, when we see great acting on film and theater, we think, oh my God, it's it's so real, it's so in the moment, it's so truthful and unexpected and surprising, like life is, and that speaks to those actors who are just willing to 
bring themselves honestly and truthfully to the audition and are active. They aren't about showing or illustrating. They're about doing. And most great actors simply and truthfully just, you know, put their attention on the other person and, and do it. And that, that's very moving to me. So it really, it depends on the part. I mean, when you have a, a, a Stephen Adley Geerges play versus say an Annie Baker play or a, um, a Sondheim musical or a Stephen Trask musical. I mean, the, di the differences, the things that the different demands are going to take certain skills. I mean, when you're dealing with Mammon and Pinter and great writing McDonough, Jess Butterworth, Yergis and Annie Baker too, great language playwrights, you keep an eye on, on actors who respect the words, actors who understand language and can embrace the language, aren't fighting the language, but are actually owning the language and marrying it with the truth of who they are. So those are some of the things that I look for. And I think you can sense it pretty quickly. It's odd because it's, when it's done, when great acting happens, it seems so simple. And yet, and when not good acting happens, it feels like it's so complicated, you know, what they're doing. And, but I have great, great respect for actors and people who are willing to put themselves out there and do it well. You talked about there being a ton of new, great new playwrights out there. How do you find these emerging writers these days? How are, how are they appearing on your radar? A variety of different ways. You know, we'll obviously get a lot of agent submissions. We'll, our sort of artistic team here, will go out and see a lot of work. A lot of it has to do with relationships over the years, whether it's relationships with writers that we've already produced who have something new, or even actors, directors, or writers who are telling us about other writers that we should put an eye, keep an eye on. I've, I feel very lucky that there have been a number of playwrights who have suggested, I'm going to give you an example. The, the current play we have, Tell Hector I Miss Him, Paolo Lazaro, was a wonderful young Puerto Rican playwright, we came to her, uh, she was a protege of Stephen Aligirgis. So that was a relationship that led to another relationship. And it's been that way many years. So I, I think the short answer is you, you, the longer you're in this business, I'm sure you have this, you have sort of a group of friends or artists that you trust. And a lot of the times those advisors you'll listen to when somebody comes to you and says, take a look here. If it's a great actor, you'll say, oh, I should definitely, because they have great taste. And you start to keep an eye, you know, keep a mental list of all that. So a lot of it is through relationships. Sometimes we just read them and they just fly off the page. Once in a while, we'll get unsolicited stuff. It's, it's harder to find stuff unsolicited, but sometimes we'll find it through schools or, you know, again, hearing about readings. But it's, it's that kind of thing. Gosh, I, and I, and I try to really listen hard and sniff that out. Like I'm not one. When, when everybody's sort of flocking to a party over here, I sort of go, hmm, this is a good opportunity to look the other direction. Do you know what I mean? Because there's always going to be the people that are left behind and, and there will be the flavor of the month and everybody's going to say, they're the flavor of the month, let's go out to them. And so there's a part of me that thinks, well, that's great, but everybody's going to be over there. Who's this person over here who's still, you know, and sometimes you find extraordinary people who were saying slightly more con controversial things, and yet if you believe in them, something... I mean, that happened with Spring Awakening. It happened with Ten of Inish more. It happened with Andy Baker. It happened with a bunch where we all of a sudden said, you know, they said, oh, Spring Awakening was too too dark for Broadway, or Lieutenant Inish more is too crazy with the violence, and, you know, which whatever it is, and you sort of go, okay, yeah, that's the nice thing about Off-Broadway, but you say... We like it, you know, even if Spring Awakening, even if the book doesn't work, the music is going to be fantastic. And then they fix the book, you know, so it was all good. What would you, advice would you give to someone looking to start a theater company today that wanted to be the Atlantic in 10, 20, 30 years? A couple of things. I mean, we were very lucky with David Mamet, William H. and William H. Macy because they were great mentors. They were extremely loyal and they instilled in us a bunch of sort of principles about you know, the business of theater and, you know, being serious about approaching the business of theater, not only an acting technique and approach to putting on plays, but also sort of a culture of, you know, things like beyond time, do your job and your job only, 
would sort of sometimes relax. Work work on your work work on your weaknesses and and, and so that in times of stress you you'll have strength. So they're all right. I can't remember all. They're wonderful like uh, adages that we've lived by that became the culture of the Atlantic. So the most important one was create your own work. And so they said at the end of the teaching, we don't have anything left to teach you. Go out and start creating your own work. So that meant you know we'd pool our resources, we'd find a theater to rent, and we'd put on one acts. And we, you know, do a bake sale. And as you know, the hilarious thing for you and I is it's, it's just gotten bigger from there. You know, the bake sale is now a yearly gala, right? That we do the fundraising for. So if you're a young company, I mean, do your best to do as much work as you can. I, I think also, you know, keep your, follow great writers you know, really keep, stay cognizant, even if they're your colleagues in school, but, you know, make sure, I think it's always helpful to do good writing. And I think that's, sometimes you can start, young companies will start and the writing's not good. And so they put out this show and the acting may be terrific, but if the writing's not good, it doesn't help anybody. So sometimes it's really best to start with a play that you think is great and then stick to it, follow through, you know, really work to get better and have a huge have a have a, a huge amount of humility we early on we had a constitution where everybody had different jobs in the theater company so even though you were an actor in the theater company i might handle development you might handle marketing and so in the early days we just we did it all ourselves and so we would we always knew we had another show coming up and we had a clear constitution of how that was going to work. And that just kept building. There were some of us who stayed committed to the theater company and others who wanted to go off to Hollywood and pursue other things. But they, we've all still stayed together and kind of fed off each other. And that's been, that's been nice. So those are some of the things that we did. But I think it's, you know, as Mamet said at one point, he said, you know, he was talking about the Atlantic. He was like, I'm not sure how they lasted so long, but I think Macy and I had this culture. And, and one of the things that you can realize sometimes is that your capacity for hard work is much larger than you ever expected. And that was a profound statement for me because I always consider myself a lazy person. But we started doing it and you all of a sudden realize, oh my God, you can actually do that much. And I mean, you know this because we do shows on Broadway. I mean, it's, it's crazy. The amount that you can do in a day is much bigger than you expected. And the more you push yourself, you realize, oh, not only is it bigger than expected, but it's exciting. So it's hard work, but it's exciting. Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes down here, knocks on your office door, and says he wants to thank you for the many years of service to the New York theatrical community. The Atlantic has produced, you just listed off some of those plays. You were, I mean, it's incredible. And what I love about the Atlantic is the uniqueness of all these shows and doing right. like, oh, too much violence? We'll do it. Spring <laughs> Awakening, young kids having sex on stage? We'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I just love yeah. that attitude. Anyway, so the genie thanks you. I thank you for it. And the genie wants to say, I want to share my gratitude with you by granting you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy and gets you angry, has you throwing things, screaming about the theater in New York? I won't call it Broadway or off-Broadway, just call it the theater in New York that you want this genie to wish away in an instant. The one thing that really makes your Martin McDonough blood boil. Well, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, but I'll try to just put it bluntly. More funding for the arts. And I guess, and I, I, I want to be clear about that because I don't necessarily mean just, I think there, there's a, there's a fundamental problem in this country in education and in society where I don't think, you know, we go over to Europe and we talk about sort of seminal things in history and we go to Italy to go to all these cities to see art and we go to London to talk about Shakespeare and there's all these incredible places and things when we, when we go to our history lessons and we talk about you know the history of the world we talk about greece and go to greece and you think about these playwrights and these philosophers and there's something that's happened where all of a sudden you know arts music theater dance writing all these things that are about human expression have become at the low end of the totem pole and i think it's actually killing a lot of the stuff that's supposed to be at the high end of the totem pole so what I'm saying is 
our experience in education, our experience. You bring theater and arts into the schools and all of a sudden the kids get more interested in science and math because they have a, a way of expressing who they are. That's what the arts is about. To come back to it is value and money for the arts. And I, that manifests itself for me. And we can't afford, it's, it's very hard for us to afford to pay our rent. Finding a way to buy theaters and finding a way to fund theaters and finding a way to just make it more accessible to people. So that's the that's the biggest challenge right now because it's it's getting priced out and it's not valued in a way that's that may not be sustainable. I mean, we'll keep duking it out, but I just I'm talking about stupid things like occupancy. You know, it's just it's so expensive to exist in New York that I hope theaters don't don't start closing because of it. So that's that's I think the thing that's most I'm co- most concerned about right now. More worried in this current administration than you were six yes. months ago? Yeah, I'm very worried. I mean, I walked to work today and I thought, wow, based on the headlines today, are we going to spend, I don't know how many billion dollars they were talking about on a wall and we're going to spend money on torture and we're going to spend money on this? I'm thinking, wow, so that's what we're going to spend money on now? And gosh, wouldn't it be more, so much more productive and life-affirming to spend money on the arts and bringing people together. So it's it, it's a difficult time, but I think it will be a, um, hopefully a, a time of coming together for all of us to uh, tell the truth. Well, that's a fantastic way to end on a note of hope and, and optimism. Hopefully, I appreciate hopefully. that. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks to all of you for listening. We'll see you next time. Don't forget about the webinar, How to Write a Script in 30 Days, guaranteed this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. All the info is on theproducersperspective.com, and it's free when you join the Producers Perspective Pro. See you then.